great event. Really happy to be here and be part of this. Just a lot of great speakers today, a lot of great ideas and thoughts. And um, it's our pleasure to kind of be at the end here today because we, we've, we've had a chance to absorb some of it and think through things. Um, I'll start off with a little of my background. So this is the Growers Talk Back panel, right? And I grew up in agriculture, but I didn't grow up in Illinois. I grew up in New Jersey on a potato and turf grass farm. And I came out here to University of Illinois for PhD in ag engineering and really just became really interested and intrigued by the corn and soybean grower and this culture and, and how, how these businesses operate out here. You know, we, we were faced with issues around potatoes and, and urban sprawl and a whole completely different group of issues. And if, if we wanted to, we would plant cabbage in a year just because we could and we had the tools to. And, and we look here and the infrastructure and everything set up for corn and soybeans. So when we think about ag tech and we think about the strategic location of University of Illinois, this town, there's just an amazing opportunity in row crop production agriculture because it's right here in our backyard. You can take computer scientists and put them in the cab of a tractor and go for a ride. You can immerse people in the problems and the situations. But of course, to get any of that, you got to talk to customers. So that's what we've kind of grouped together here. And the other um, kind of co-moderator for me today is Jason Little. Now what I was gonna have Jason do is just talk a little about the group that we've assembled here and why, and trying to give a cross section of um, some different growers and different ways in which they're tackling the same kind of production problems here and um, what advantages that gives them in some cases and then also some of the challenges and we'll, we'll talk through that. So. Um, like the other speakers and other panels before, if you have a question, just come up to the mics and then uh, Jason and I will cut in to whatever we're doing and, and have the questions in the middle. If you'd like to, we'll answer questions at the end. So um, looking forward to a great, great little chat here. So Jason, if you wanna kind of introduce everyone. Yeah, sure. Wow, that's super loud. Make sure everybody's awake, everybody out in the back can hear me and People that are still hanging out outside know the session started, right? So, um, like Chris said, uh, my name is Jason Little, uh, co-moderator here, which uh, let's go ahead and give Chris a round of applause for making a brave decision for asking me to come up here with him. <laughs> um, I was born and raised here in central Illinois, grew up on a dairy farm before you ask. Yes, there used to be dairy farms in central Illinois. Um, but yeah. Like Chris said, uh, to just the, the, the ag tech space here, I know we've talked a lot about um, you know, the ag tech that's coming out of kind of this, the, the flyover states uh, versus Silicon Valley and um, you know, what we've got with a bunch, of, uh, a bunch of farm boys starting to do this. And you know, what I always say is I'm, I'm not from Silicon Valley. I, don't wear skinny jeans. My jeans are tight because I'm fat. <laughs> so, um, yeah. But we, we've got a good group of guys here. We've got a good range of things. Uh, Heath, and, and I'll, we'll have each one of them introduce uh, uh, themselves and talk about their operations a little bit too. But just kind of the reasoning behind why we chose some of these guys. Um, you know, Heath, uh, a uh, younger farmer down in southern Illinois, does a lot of on-farm storage, uh, is doing some software development. Uh, Ken uh, is a local uh, farmer here from uh, Mansfield, uh, Scatter Acre Farms, is a very early adopter, uh, worked with a lot of tech companies, worked with us very early on at Agrable. Um, Josh was actually uh, one of my account managers that I had working with me at Agrable, uh, and he left to go back to his family farm uh, third generation, so he's got a strong background there uh, too. And then Matt uh, has got a, a farming operation uh, north of here, fairly scattered out, it's got some logistics things, and then he's involved uh, with a drone company, uh, Crop Copter as well. So, um, but I'll turn it over to these guys to go through and do a little introduction of their own. Yeah, as uh, Jason said, my name's Heath Husinge. Um probably the farthest most south farmer here on this group down at uh, Casey, Illinois, fourth, gen fourth generation family farm. Um, and uh, I don't want anybody here to get the impression that I'm able to farm because of my own doing. Um, if, if my parents and grandparents had not done what they had done back in the day, I wouldn't be here and have this opportunity. So, Ken Dallenberg and I farm 
uh, corn and soybeans just west of town here and have actually been involved in uh, technology for almost 30 years now and have worked with many different uh, companies, both the major companies and startup companies today. And uh, one of the biggest problems I see is the fact that uh, whenever companies are, are looking at bringing an idea forth, uh, you need to have the agronomy, if it's related to the farm, down with agronomists working with you to help you bring a product forward because ideas that scientifically work may not work on the farm. Yeah, Josh Plunk here. I farm with my family, same town as Ken, Mansfield, Illinois, just west of here. Uh, first of all, I gotta say, Jason, it's good to see you again. I see you haven't shaved since I left Agrable. Uh, <laughs> but uh, we face uh, a difficult challenge ourselves where uh, I farm alongside of two of my cousins and my brother. We've recently come back to the farm back in July and uh, we're in the middle of a succession plan going from one generation to the next. So uh, technology and agriculture is going to play a big, big role in that moving forward in our business. Um, there are certain things that the older generation has the luxury of doing, especially on the terms of uh, labor. Uh, that we're just not going to be able to afford to do right out of the gate in technology. I feel like it's going to be a really big help in that going forward. Uh, Matt Barnard, um, we, I farm with my brother and my father um, in about five counties north of here. Um, we're a builder generation, so a lot of times in agriculture they talk about uh, there's three generations, one that built it, one that maintained it, and then the last generation gets to blow it. And um, so no pressure, Plunk. Um, but uh, I, I'm a builder generation, and so um, we farm a lot of rented ground, uh, slowly starting to build that own base. But um, I, I love the idea of technology. I love the idea of data. I think about our farm more of we raise widgets. Um, but uh, my, my margin to error is very slim. So there's not an 80 I can sell to keep the, the farm liquid if I'm wrong. And so um, we, we, are, we are very early adopters to a lot of things, but also fairly skeptical uh, about some of the, the claims that are made. Great, thanks guys. Um, you know, we've heard in, in various ways here really um, that somehow technology is gonna come and solve all your problems, right? In ways that you don't even know yet, you know, that it's gonna solve problems that you don't even realize it can solve for you. And, you know, as you think about that and think about that statement, I mean, that's, that's real excitement, you know? From a technology side, I see that as excitement and um, people getting interested in this market and trying to help production agriculture. But, you know, from a customer side, you may see and have a different take on that, you know, for sure. You know, will it solve all your problems? So when we think about technology and you think about what's out there and you think about gaps in your business, what do you think in terms of technology um, would, would really help here, you know? What, what problem do you have that's a big problem that you think technology could solve for you on the farm today? So start with Heath. Yeah, the, uh, the biggest problem and threat, and I think that um, this will be a similar answer across the board for us, um, is labor. Um, and I hope that, you know, through John Deere or Case, I, or Case IH or Agco or some of those great companies or even a startup here could really help solve that problem. Um, I'm, I'm very fortunate that a lot of our farm help is 65, 70 years old, and they've been helping my grandfather farm since he was, you know, in high school. But the day is going to come whenever those people are no longer around to help farm, and it's... It's, it, it, it really worries me because I don't know how we're going to get across the acres that we do farm, you know, um, just how are, how are you going to get the crop planted in a timely fashion? You don't have people to operate the equipment. And then um, the other part of that is people who are qualified to operate the equipment. I don't know who all was here last year, but I shared the story. We hired on a young individual about my age, mid-20s, and um, he, he was going down the road in a tractor and he was on his phone, I don't know if he was on Instagram or texting, and he rear-ended another tractor. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
So, I mean, it's, I mean, I just, I cannot make this stuff up, but uh, I wish, I wish I could. Um, so that's, that's probably the biggest threat or technology um, opportunity I see on our farm. You know, as you, as you look at what technology can do for us today, it's been a, a labor-saving benefit. I will agree labor is a big issue. But one of the bigger issues is, you know, over half my time I spend in the office uh, taking care of management, of buying inputs, marketing, et cetera, et cetera. But we need a company that can look at or build a company that can do the seamless integration of all the economic data into our precision ag data and make it work real time. And we don't have, we have companies that have tried various things to do that. Um, their processes are somewhat still manually oriented, but we do need a seamless uh, process to come forward because some of us as working farm managers spend as many hours in the field as we can, but we still have to spend the desk time to make the operation profitable. Yep, I mentioned uh, labor in my opening statement, and Heath, I got we're in the same boat, man. Like, a lot of our natural attrition, it's going to come natur naturally. We got older gentlemen working for us that, you know, they're on their way out. And although that'll help us in labor costs, those are jobs that are going to have to be filled, and it's going to take the next generation of us busting our butts, working countless hours. Um, but again, technology is going to have to play a big role in that. Another big thing we're into is we, we deal with uh, specialty crops, premium crops. Uh, we grow seed corn and seed beans. Um, during these tight margins, that really helps us out. It really keeps us profitable. And the one question that I asked, who the, the seed company that we grow for is Pioneer, asked them, you know, what do you see the grower looking at in the future, the growers that are going to be growing for you that are successful? And they say the number one thing is they adopt technology and they're aggressive about it and they're not afraid to fail. Um, so we take that to heart and that's what we've always strived for. Uh, we don't want to be afraid to fail. Uh, but uh, that's obviously during these tight margins in, in during our succession process, that's something we got to stay on top of because these premium crops are really what's going to make or break us. And if we're not careful, uh, we, we just got to do our due diligence. I think the guys, uh, labor is, the, is a huge issue. Um, and uh, it's not going to be solved overnight. Um, even if we do have the technology, we have to have somebody that, like Heath and, and Jack have alluded to. Sorry. I call, that's your cousin. Josh. Josh. The better looking one. Uh, yeah. Um, but, um, you know, I, I, the, the two things that really keep me up at night are um, ROI. I, I, I think a lot of people think yield is what it's all about. And I can make more money a lot of times not trying to get that last 10 or 15 bushel. And I don't think people, every time that I've ever had a conversation with somebody, it's always about this foo-foo dust or if we put this on or whatever else, use this technology, we're going to get that extra 10 bushel. And at the end of the day, that 10 bushel might cost me 100 bucks to do, and it's, it's not scalable. So I don't think, everything I heard so far today talks about scalability, about adoption. To me, scalability is about the economics of does it actually make sense. But probably the bigger thing that I'm more, the most worried about is I heard um, clean and green and all this other stuff. So um, all of us, I, I come from a multi-generational farm, um, except the generations before me weren't nice and, or in a position to have their own stuff. We probably worked for people like this, right? And so, um, but I hate it anytime somebody talks to a livestock producer or a, a row crop producer and insinuates that we're not concerned about the land or our livestock, that we're not good stewards. So they're gonna have to think for us by throwing all this stuff at us to make it feel good. At the end of the day, I kind of think about, um, you know, if you watch China right now, they're, because the Asian flu, killing hogs left and right, right? And there's going to be somebody over there that's going to be willing for a pound of bacon, and they're not going to care what it's going to cost because they want a pound of bacon. At some point in time, I wonder how much of 
the good nature and the good fortune we have as Americans starts to taint our view about, you know, um, we've got to do all this stuff so much better when we forget there's so many people that aren't eating or don't have a diet that's not good enough. And they're going to try to shove stuff down on us that's not sustainable, that will continue to put us out of production. Um, but at the end of the day, feel good about buying a, you know, a, a gallon of milk from such and such location. And somehow we've got to bridge that gap to tell our story that we as an American farmer are growing the safest, most predictable, and most abundant crop anywhere in the world. And that's why when it always comes down to it, people try to hurt us with our trade or whatever else because they know at the end of the day, we're always gonna have a supply. But at the same time, they're gonna to try to come back and push us to do things that continue to make us less profitable. Or things, quite honestly, some of this clean water, you know, some of these acts come through are just, it's not feasible for us to farm. And so we gotta find that balance. Part of that's our problem. We gotta be way better educated about what we do, why we do it, and the quality of the product we put out. But at the end of the day, I think my future and my children's future on this farm is not gonna be dictated by the technology that you all create to allow me to be more efficient or make, uh, make a bushel. It's going to be what the folks that are buying our products, the end users, allow us to do. And if I can live in that paradigm or not, I don't know. So Matt, you brought up a good point about profitability and thinking, and, and Ken, you, you brought it up too, that it's, this is a business, right? We're, we're, we're in this for money. And if you think about growth, and I think all businesses grow or they perish, right? So as you guys think about growth, you know, there are a number of ways you can kind of grow your operation and grow your profitability by growing your operation. You can somehow get inputs less for, for less, which typically means you need more acres. So now you've got more acres, you've got even less time, okay? So you're chasing that route. You know, another way is that you find a specialty market. You know, Josh, you alluded to that, that there's some specialty markets that you're able to access. You can get a premium for your crop as a result of that, and then you can manage maybe differently to try to go after that. You know, or you can just generally increase your, um, your ag tech usage or implementation you know, in order to increase your agronomy so that you're producing more with less, again, driving the cost down. What, what do you think, just as a, as a yes, one or the other kind of thing down the panel here, of, of what you think is the most important one or where you think the most opportunity lies for you right now you know, in terms of just growth of your operation, becoming more efficient with your agronomy or looking for specialty markets of those three? Where, where do you guys fall in terms of where you might be going with those? Yeah, yes to all of them. Um, you know, Chris and I were in a meeting yesterday with a, a company, a South American seed company that are planting the exact same beans that we plant here for, what was it, 22 or $32? And we're paying 70? It's the same technology. You know, it's kind of like the idea about dry, buying drugs in Canada, you know? Um, and so we're in a global competitive marketplace, but we bear all of, the, all of the burden of the technology advancements and some of those things. So I think one of the, thing we gotta, one of the things we have to do is continue to, um, the swing years are what hurts us, right? You know, so if I would have anticipated that you know, the, the tariff thing would have happened on the soybean side of things and selling 70% of my crop, I would have sold like 180% of my crop before me and then shorted the heck out of it. And, um, you know, I probably wouldn't be sitting here. I'd be getting a tan somewhere and I'd be about 30 pounds lighter. But I, I didn't anticipate those things, we know, right? We yeah. know that's not true, Matt. No, <laughs> I like Dairy Queen too much. But, you know, it's, it's so you ha we, have to, we have to continue to look to try to cut cost on the input side and be efficient. But the biggest thing is, is we, and I think Little says this all the time, we go against Mother Nature and she swings a big stick because she bats last and that's one thing I have no control over. And so how can I do everything right and still fail? And that's a lot of times what it kind of feels like. I mean, I got 200 acres of beans in the ground right now. I'm negotiating with a crop insurance agent to say, what are we gonna do with them? They never tested below 17% and an elevator wouldn't take them because they were full because they never emptied their beans from last year because of the China trade tariff. So right now I've got 200 acres that potentially I'm gonna take zero dollars of revenue on. I still gotta pay all the rent. I still gotta pay all the inputs. I gotta still pay all that stuff. I didn't do anything wrong. Mother nature bat, bat at last. 
and, and she threw some heat. Yeah, I completely agree, Matt. And one thing that you alluded to, Chris, is agro agronomy. And that's one thing that uh, goes hand in hand with the specialty crops we're, we're dealing with. Uh, for example, on the seed bean side, uh, this past year, must have been all those hot days. Germination rates were a huge, huge issue for us. Um, and all seed bean growers across the corn belt. Uh, so one thing that uh, would be big for us is, you know, we need to continue to investigate how can we uh, better adapt to that, uh, whether that's getting into the fields earlier or continuing to work on varieties that are more tolerant to those kind of conditions. How do we set our combines better to where we're not cracking seed coats? Uh, that's a big, big thing that's going to help us as we begin our succession because, uh, you know, same thing with corn. Uh, you get graded very, very highly on, on the quality on some of your specialty crops, and you, you got to continue to investigate and, and just explore how you're going to get the cleanest grain coming out of there. Um, and a lot of that's done in season. Uh, but, again, um, Matt, the... When it all comes down to it, I agree with you 100% on the ROI instinct. Uh, we are not yield chasers. Uh, being yield chasers has put you in bad places before. Um, I'm not necessarily going to strive for the highest yields because I go into some specialty crops if we're not getting seed corn on certain fields. We're going to grow white corn and chase that premium. I'm not going to get a higher yield than I would on a normal number two yellow corn but the specialty crops have really been good to us, and you know that's an avenue that we're going to continue to go down. I would say that, you know, I would agree that this is not a, a period of time economically where growth is is the right direction to grow to go in the in looking at efficiency. We have really most of us that are in highly managed farms wrung all the efficiency out of input buying and uh, uh, purchasing and so that leaves marketing and marketing really is one area you have to know what your unit cost of production is in in this day and age uh, you know having all those numbers constantly with you to make the smart and right marketing decisions is is truly important to not only have a return on investment but also to survive because uh, uh, you know gross dollars per acre are important but it's the bottom line that'll keep you in business and so that's why earlier I'd mentioned you know having a platform that can bring all of the functionality of fertility of yield of input cost, of our overhead cost, and our day-to-day uh, -day living expenses together is uh, an area that you in the uh, startup world and in different data platforms can help us as farmers. Yeah, uh, one, one unique point that uh, I want to hit on, and everybody pretty much covered all the, all the big ones too, um, one of the ways on our farm that we've been trying, you know, to raise that, that, that revenue for us is Chris alluded to it. So the, the huge farms, they can get better prices on fertilizer, on seed, on things like that, just because you deal in volume. And one of the things that we did and worked out pretty well, and I don't, I don't have the time to do it, I can't scale it. So if someone in this room could solve it for me, it'd be a huge help. Um, uh, on our marketing, we, the, the elevator will only give you so much per bushel for a uh, bushel of corn. Let's say, hey, if you bring us a million bushels of corn, we'll give you a little more for that. So what I did is I started calling all the farmers in my area and said, hey, how many bushel can you give me to put in on this deal? And we all just worked together as one big group and pooled our bushels and brought them to the grain facility and it really helped us all out because the grain facility could then market all those bushels at one time they knew it was coming in, and for the grower, we got more bang for our buck. So if someone could solve that for me, I'll be the first one to help you. Mm -hmm. So um, 
and a brilliant logistical move on my part. I sat at this end where Chris is down there with all the questions. So I'm kind of having to wing this, but um, Heath, you, you, you just kind of brought up a good point there. And throughout the conference, we've, we've had conversations with, um, you know, the investors and how they're interacting with the startups. And uh, we've had, you know, discussions about, you know, the, the established companies and the corporate approach to how they're um, interacting with, the, you know, the startups and the entrepreneurs. Um, and there certainly are a few ag accelerators. I think Ag Launch has got uh, growers that are actually on the board. Um, from, from your guys' point of view, from the grower's point of view, at what point should the farmer be brought in to help shape the direction of ag tech? And Matt, I'm gonna hold you for last because I know yours gonna be the best, so. I don't know it's that. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna say first because there, there's a lot of products out there that they, people will bring onto our farm and they say, hey, look at this tool, and it, it's really incredible what it does, but it really doesn't solve a problem for me. So come ask me what my problem is first, and I'll help you solve it. Well, my answer is, is that farmer needs, if it's, it's something that's going to be dealt with in agriculture, there needs to be a farmer uh, brought into the picture either as an advisor uh, if it's a, uh, an agronomy type of, of uh, product or whatever, make sure you have someone who is a qualified agronomist there because uh, I've dealt with several startups who the people are good scientists, they have the science down, but they don't know a darn thing about agriculture and what we do every day and what impact that product might be. And I would be speaking today more about the soil health type products today, the biologicals. A lot of startups out there that think they have the next miracle product for us, but they have, no, they have the science of why it's going to work, but they have no agronomy background or data to show us, you know, will it work for Heath or myself, um, you know, and is a return on investment. We don't just spend dollars just to use products. Yeah, I agree. Very important. Uh, I would go as far to say is if you have two companies selling pretty much the same product, uh, you would be able to tell the difference between one that has uh, influence from somebody in the farming industry versus someone who has nobody involved. Um, kind of an example I would give is uh, on our farm, we got our first monitor back in 2007. Uh, our dealer for that stayed on with us until about 2013, 2014. And the, uh, the support there and their knowledge wasn't the greatest. Uh, after they, uh, we, we switched to a new dealer around that time, one who owns their own acreage, does all their own farming. Uh, it's been incredible amount of support. Uh, we'll do our, our due diligence, and when there's a problem, we'll troubleshoot as bad as we can before we ever rely on them. But there is also always a sense of uh, ease knowing that if somehow we're not able to figure it out, they, they'll know exactly how we're explaining it, and they'll always have the answer. So I would agree, yeah, very important, and uh, you can absolutely tell the difference. Um, I... I I would agree with it, what everybody has said so far. Early farmer interaction is critical, but I also uh, I think we're in a in an age now where you know you don't need a publisher to get a book out on Amazon. You can publish it yourself if you if you so like. And I think we're going to see this next wave of innovation in ag. That so far everything has been driven by big conglomerates. That the technology that has been delivered so far has somehow benefited another area of their business. And so I, you got to have this because then it may be you have to spray this or you can use this or you can use this or whatever else. I'm extremely excited in the next 10 years because I think technology and, and crops with CRISPRs and all this other stuff as far as how you could put traits in or some of the other technology where we're starting to get people in that um, they, they have the opportunity to, uh, to, to change without the huge startup cost. I think you're gonna, we're gonna see an, uh, hopefully an evolution of 10 or 15 years here where we've got a lot of awesome ideas that are actually trying to solve a problem, not sell like three other products in a company's portfolio. And uh, I'm extremely excited 
for that because I think then you'll start to have a lot of questions about what do you need versus this is what I want to sell you and so I need to create a problem to solve a problem so I can create another one and that seems like what's happened in, up, to, up to this time. I would also add to that Matt and basically the business model that a startup or a company follows is is important too because you need to understand the marketplace that you're working in if you're going to bring a product to the market. Well, good. You know, one, one thing I want to change gears a little bit here and talk about things that uh, maybe you're tired of. You know, we've, there's a lot of buzzwords in tech, right? And um, if you had to pick one, your top one, the most annoying term that technology folks are using around you and you hear it and you go, oh God, not that again. If there's one more company that shows up using that term, I'm gonna, I'm gonna lose it, you know? Um, what do you guys think? I mean, for, for me, I'll, I'll give you one of, one of mine. It's, it's a solution, you know? I, they're, they're showing up with a solution to your problem and it's very, very hard for anyone to truly understand what someone's problem is. And that, that word solution is such a difficult one. It, that's a trigger for me, always. But I'm interested to see what, what you guys think in terms of just your experience of, you know, if one more of these companies shows up at my farm gate, you know, I'm, I'm going to lose it. You know, is, is there something that you just feel super saturated or a term that you feel is just got to go? What do you think? Um, for me, I, don't, I really don't think any companies are named this, at least I hope they're not, but it's, it's a term that they associate with that they're trying to, they're coming into ag to disrupt it. I don't want to disrupt my problems, I want to fix my problems. <laughs> I'm going to have to agree with Heath that, uh, um, well, mainly because I've been a part of one of those disruptor companies, but that is a term that it's beginning to be monotonous because you pick up Crop Life magazine and a few other like that, and that's what they're honing in on. The other one, if, if I had to use a, a term, uh, and it deals with, you know, soil health, if I hear that one more time, over the last three years, everybody's honed in on that. Well, do something about it. Don't just talk about soil health because don't come on my farm, talk about what you're going to do about it, not, well, I can help you on your soil health. One term that obviously for me comes to mind, and this is due to my time at Agribol, uh, was I, I've spent countless hours on the phone talking with farmers about the word sustainability, and I have to go through about at least the first 30 minutes of discussion explaining that that's just you being a good steward of your land and be, you being... Uh, you know, a farmer. You know, you wouldn't be here today if you weren't sustainable. Uh, but I, I think it gets taken the, the wrong way um, in the farmer's mind, and I do hear it all the time as a farmer myself now, and I'm kind of getting sick of it as well. <laughs> but uh, I, at least I understand that, yes, that means you're being a good steward, and uh, I think uh, that's a better way to communicate that. Um, for me, it's bundle. I hate, like if, if you buy this and then you bundle it with this and then we'll throw in this and we'll bundle that, then you get this, you know, and I'm like, you know, how about I just buy the best thing of each one of those things and if it's not in your bundle, well, tough cookies, you know, but, um, you know, there it comes back and it's, it's always bundle and so I, I hate bundle. What, what do you think, Jason? You got to have, you got to have one. Well, mine, mine's, uh, uh, this is my old chemistry days showing up and me being a nozzle nerd, but I really detest the term synergy and synergistic effect. So, but let's, let's uh, it, I, it kind of feels like we're getting a little grumbly up here, so <laughs> <laughs> let's, uh, let's, let's see if we can't swing this around and go a different direction. And I kind of love the fact that every time I talk in the microphone, Laura gets this horrified look on her face. <laughs> Um, what one piece of technology, ag tech, has really benefited your farm? What, what's, if you had to name one thing that's made the most difference in the last five years, ten years, what would that be? You know, I, I, uh, selfishly, all the guidance stuff, um, any of the steering things. I mean, my dad won't buy me lunch, but uh, if I, 
I come home with a piece of equipment that does not have steering in it. Is that why you showed up for a free lunch? I know I was a little late, but I'll take one with me. Um, but uh, yeah, if 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 the guidance thing, um, just I, I we all like straight lines. I mean, if you will go past any farmer, if I'm selling them something, I will not pull into somebody's yard if their grass is crooked. Like a good farmer will mow their grass in just like they do their fields. I mean, it's true. I mean, it's, you can, I can, I can tell you what brand of seed corn a guy is going to buy, what color equipment there is, by what the, how their grass is mowed, what brand of truck they have and what color it is. But anyway, I mean, that, that whole idea, I used to always think it was about being, you know, going back and forth, being straight lines, but I uh, completely underestimated the fatigue factor of it. You're so much fresher because you are trying to cover more ground, stuff goes faster. But I mean, I cannot tell you the amount of Netflix seasons I've watched. I don't want to admit to this, but like at two o'clock in the morning when you're trying to stay up because you're still playing corn and you know, you went through season eight of Shameless and um, <laughs> you know, it's, you, you wonder what you're going to do. But the fact that I'm even having that predicament is because the technology, I trust it. As long as I uh, keep 60 pounds in my seat, which I, I'm okay with, um, it'll turn itself and do all those things. You know, there's a lot of cool stuff, other stuff that we use, but I mean, um, that, is, that is priceless. Yeah, I agree, Matt. Uh, one of the biggest things for us, uh, and uh, this is kind of something I adopted from my time before Agribowl, I was a farm manager down in Texas. Uh, every farm down there in West Texas has a center pivot irrigation on their farm. Uh, we recently put up a center pivot on our farm. We're adopting irrigation. Uh, big thing for that is, again, with the specialty markets, they like predictability. They want water on their farm because they want to know they are going to have a supply at the end of the year. Uh, we put up a center pivot, just went through our first year of it, and uh, seed corn kind of works weird. You're, you're really only raising about 100 bushel uh, <laughs> Corn, but the way the premium works out is on a comparative advantage how well you perform to others uh, they, they there's an algorithm that equates a yield uh, based on how well you perform compared to others and basically what they came out with was we raised an equivalent of 360 bushel corn on that farm uh, that paid for a third of that irrigation system that year in year number one uh, so from an ROI standpoint uh, and in the past five years I would say that that's been the biggest uh, technological advantage we've made in the past five years. Besides guidance, to me, one of the biggest stress relievers is uh, John Deere has the uh, My Operations app, which on my phone, I can see where my guys are running in the field and where their tractor is. and. They can lie to me and say they're out of fuel, and I can check now and know they're not out of fuel and know that they've got three rounds left, and they better stay and finish it instead of going home at night. But, you know, as far as, as time management and, and uh, labor management, that's a big stress reliever, which helps, you know, ease your mind so you can concentrate on the things you do. But the uh, whole guidance factor of being able to have a, a turn automation where you, you know, as Matt said, you know, you can sit and watch Netflix for an hour on end. I've watched the same things you have. And, uh, you know, come home at night, my wife says, well, what did you do today? Oh, I read this book. Um, I want to hit on what Ken said, too, because the My John Deere, the My Operation Center, that's, that's a really incredible tool. You know, I can be planting one field, and I know... If the, if the next field I'm going to, where, where the guy's at in the field, how much he has left. Um, I can know if, if he's been sitting for 30 minutes and why are you sitting for 30 minutes, why aren't you moving? Um, but guidance, man, guidance is huge. Um, I grew up with guidance. I didn't know what it was like without guidance until one day I lost guidance and I think my father thought I was having a heart attack in the tractor because it was not straight at all. I was going this way and that way and back and forth, and uh, I really didn't realize how valuable that was, because it is, it is a mental strain, you know, following a, throwing your marker out there and trying to follow that marker all day. It's, it wears on you, so it's good. You know, one thing we, we hear a lot about is, um, you know, and even the, the group up before here was talking about, 
data science and the demands and the need for clean information coming out of, out of the world. You know, I information's flowing from everything. The guidance, I mean, you're talking about a clear example of, of, of information flowing is the fuel amount, to the, how long it's been sitting, all kinds of information flowing back off of just the equipment. And we can think of, of that coming from all different areas, you know, and that was one of the, the big things in ag tech is how do, we, how do we get data into some of these systems? You know, in Agrable, we tried to incentivize by saying, we'll help you model into the future what's going to happen, and that, that gives you some advantage. And the better quality information you put in, the more results and value you get from this, that incentivizes you to put in good data. Now you've got good data, now you can do something good with it. You know, but we think about all of this information, a lot of it personal. You know, we start talking about financial sides of things here, putting in cash rent. Now, you know, that, that number gets out, your neighbor who's competing with you for the same piece of ground now knows how much you paid, offers a little bit more to kind of undercut you on something, right? There, there's some of this inf financial information's valuable. It's valuable to others, but it's also very valuable to you. And keeping that kind of confidential is important too. And I think as, as we move towards that integration of all this information together, there's a chance that your information, your data aggregated is going to be out there. Profitability, these kind of numbers are gonna be known by other than your Excel spreadsheet sitting on your computer. You know, just maybe talk a little bit about how comfortable you are with data sharing so far, and then what maybe worries you have or, or, or concerns, or maybe not. Maybe you're looking forward to how that goes in the future in terms of data. And um, I don't know, Jason, if you have a thought on that or clarify. Well, I was just gonna to ask to clarify, is there uh, certain types of data that you want to share that becomes valuable if it's shared and aggregated? And is there certain types of data that you don't want shared under any circumstances is my thought. Yeah, so on, on mine, I, I'm a pretty naive guy. Uh, I'm pretty much an open book as long as uh, you're not some company based out of, you know, some send, send me money company out of Russia, then I'll, I'll give you my data to look at. Um, I, I trust you guys won't do anything bad with it, so. I guess, you know, as you look at, at the data, ultimately in the data aggregation, as long as it doesn't come down to an area that's, you know, if it's within 50 miles or whatever, people are not going to hone in and say that's your operation. Uh, you know, data sharing does have value in, you know, looking at, at hybrids, looking at yields, looking at well, looking at returns to see what's the economy of the rest of the country doing is important too. Um, I've, well, from the start, back in the, the early 90s, uh, when we started all the yield monitoring, et cetera, you know, I've always shared data around the world. And so to me, sharing yield data is, you know, that's a no-brainer because it's, uh, it's not something that's really going to come back and haunt you. But the financial information, know who you're working with and, you know, the uh, agreements that you sign to be in a platform, know what they say. Big thing that I like to do is I like my data to be more local. Uh, something that I like it to be within two counties of where I'm at, which I uh, don't always have a big supply of data at my disposal. But... Uh, no, like something that is working here isn't necessarily going to work in central Nebraska. Uh, another comment I would make on that is uh, as far as sharing data on our farm, we have a really great relationship with Pioneer growing seed corn for them and because of that we do have to be careful with what data we are sharing, planting their numbers that they don't even let us know on, on our fields. Uh, so from that standpoint, you know, I, I love the idea of sharing data, and there's a lot of good information that can come from, uh, from it, but uh, in our unique situation, we just have to be careful. I probably have a little bit different look. Um, I'm sure if I asked most of the folks in this side of the room, um, you probably have uh, an idea what you're going to do with your IP and how you're going to protect that, maybe even more than you know what the vision of your company is, and this data is my IP. And so I actually, we have taken it on our farm the opposite way in which um, when we rent farms, if they want the data, they're actually going to reduce our rent or pay us for it. 
And so if not, if that's my data, that's my secret sauce. Now, the thing is, is I do share that with my peer group. And so most, most groups or most people think that larger growers don't get along or we're ultra competitive. It's just exactly opposite. Um, you know, we share, we'll get together and share and, you know, you just get just outside that fringe area where you become a p competitor and we'll open our books up to them and say, okay, you know, it's, we kind of feel like everybody's against us on this thing, whether it be right or wrong. I mean, we heard yesterday one of the best sayings is, it seems like there's a lot of people farming the farmer. And, um, and so, you know, that's the only place where I really truly feel that's unbiased and protected. I've, I have a hard time believing that when I put something into a cloud, even without, with or without my consent, somebody somewhere is not looking at it. And if they do, I want compensated for it. And if not, I'm not gonna give it to you. And maybe that's, maybe that's not pushing the, the, the bar ahead and maybe that's being a little bit of a more protection, having a more you know, protective posture um, but um, we spend a lot of time doing stuff with ideas that don't work and nobody comes back and compensates us when it failed, you know? And so uh, the, the successes that we have or that data that we have, that's ours. And uh, we, we keep that pretty close to our vest. Well, I, I think if there's questions, migrate to the mics. I've got one more question here to ask the group um, to talk a little bit about. We've, We've talked here a lot about production and, and other, other aspects, but you know, one of the things, and I know there's some differences here on the panel, so I wanted to highlight it, was the, the storage of grain. And, and what you do, you know, so it's come off the field, you've, you've done all this work to plant it, you got lucky, the weather went your way, now you've got the grain. What do you guys do with it from there? And, and, and maybe just kind of, I, there's enough difference here that I think you just talk about what you do with the grain from the time it leaves the combine until it arrives as dollars in your bank, you know, what does that look like for each of you? So for our operation, um, as soon as we pick or har harvest our crop, we'll put it in a semi and we bring it up to our farm. We, uh, we have enough storage on farm to store 95% um, of, of e everything we raise. Uh, so that process, it comes in on a semi and we have, some, we have a certified scale there, punch the ticket, I'll take the truck over to a, a pit, I'll dump the grain in, and then I'll see how wet it is. And then depending on how wet that grain is, I actually have to put it in a dryer and dry the corn. And then once it's dry, I can store it and cool it down. Um, for those of you that don't know what a dryer is, it's basically a big torch. And you pass the grain in front of it at, at different speeds depending on how wet it is, and it sucks the moisture out of it. Because if you just put really, really wet corn in a bin, it'll rot, and that's, that's your money. So um, that's, the, that's the process for us. I'm a little bit different. I have no storage, and so it all goes to town at harvest. And so my decision-making process is, you know, dealing with marketing, dealing with basis, and then determining, you know, what's the best uh, contracts to use, hedge to arrive, and we have to do more on the marketing side and forward marketing of the crop, which keeps you attuned to the market much more than if you're in a storage situation where you have the ability to react to a change in basis or a push in, in bids locally or even at the processor farther away. And so in my situation, you just have to be attuned every day to, to market change and know your cost so that you can market when you're at a profitable level because the, the goal is to be in the upper third of the marketing range for the year to, to be able to, to get a, uh, uh, well, hopefully a profit, but you know, at least uh, uh, break even in these economic times. Kind of a mixture between the two. Uh, we do do some fall delivery, um, but similar to heat, a lot of our grain will come out of the field uh, on a semi and we don't have a big leg or pit or a dryer or anything so we do have to wait until that grain has dried down in the field um, and then we have a what's called a rollover pit that the semi will go o over um, open its hopper doors the grain will flow out and that'll that uh, pit will take it on a belt through an auger up uh, into a bin um, so a lot of our storage is again for Pioneer. Uh, they'll take a couple numbers that they'll start conditioning right away. 
Um, but we have to wait quite a while most of the time uh, for them to take delivery on any of that. Uh, another thing that we deal with as uh, bins open up during that period, uh, Pioneer pays a little bit of an incentive to be able to store some of their corn in our bins as they start to open up. So that plays into account as well. Uh, we, we deliver, uh, we're a combination of kind of all, the, everybody ahead of time um, that, that spoke. Where we are around our home base and have infrastructure, we do use grain facilities. Um, depending on how well we market it or not, if we can forward contract and we can deliver from the field, we do. Um, we are to also use temporary storage uh, grain bags where we'll actually um, bag it in the field um, in a, it's a, it's not neoprene, um, but it's, it's, a, it's like a nine millimeter plastic um, that will make these, I don't know if you guys have seen these big white tubes out in the middle of the field, but we'll, we'll build, build, build bags in the hopes of trying to do a hybrid between the two. So we know that we can't keep them in there as long as they've been, um, but we're trying to pick up the carry in the market and if we can, um, if we can put it in that bag temporarily um, then we'll come back out and we'll extract it from that bag sometime, you know, usually when it's in midwinter, you know, February, March, why it still froze because uh, it's, a, it's not good if it's not. Um, but uh, that allows us to, to get um, a little bit of a hybrid for both, the best of both worlds at a lot lower cost of actually building, uh, you know, a permanent structure. Um, it's got its challenges. I mean, you know, uh, uh, a kid having a little bit too much fun on a Friday night with a pocket knife can do all sorts of damage um, because, like I said, it's only nine millimeters thick. They can, you can lose a whole crop if somebody comes on the side and slices it or a deer or a, you know, a bird picks the top or whatever else. And so if you can keep the bag sealed, the idea is whatever you put it in, it comes back out. Um, I'd say that happens about 80% of the time. So. Questions in the room? We're getting down to the end. Matt, you said something fairly early on uh, that you didn't try to optimize for yield because the cost of topping out a field is greater than the additional profit you'd get. So if you get partway through a crop year, and some part of your uh, field looks like it's under some sort of stress. How do you decide whether it's worth doing something about it or say, well, you know, if I let that part of the field go, I don't have any cost in fixing it, and if I don't get any income from that small part and everything else comes through, I'll be fine. How do you do that calculation? Yeah, so um, w how we do our budgets is that uh, crop insurance-wise, uh, you have a a guaranteed yield or every field has got what they they call the T yield or it says hey this field's average 10 year average is this so let's just say it's 200 bushel so if we do as we build our budgets we we build for 85 percent of that and so as we're putting down nutrients or whatever else we put for 80 85 percent of that as the season comes to, to us and as we get into this, you know, our first thing is to get the ground worked and get it planted. And if we have a good stand, that's, that's our first indication that we're going to have a decent crop. If that stand is poor, we, we can't recover from it. I mean, in some places, if they have a bad stand, they'll just abandon it. Um, I don't think if you could get a central Illinois farmer to abandon a crop, we're going to love it until we go broke. But... You know, so you, you look at that and then you kind of watch the season. So we do use um, satellite or drone imaging. We try to get an idea of the biomass of that crop. Um, we use tools to tell us which fields are trending up or fin fields are trending down. And, um, you know, we used to try to take the areas of our fields that were poor and build them back up. And we never could get them quite to be what they needed to be. So instead, now what we do is we take our fields or our areas of our fields that constantly reward us and that's where we spend our money. So it's kind of like the opposite of no child left behind, right? So, I mean, it's, it's uh, <laughs> right, or, right or wrong. We say, hey, this, is, this kid's from the good side of the tracks, and we're going to take him to Harvard or U of I or wherever we're going to go. And, and that's, what, that's exactly what we do. 
and we go through on that. And at the end of the day, the idea is hopefully we're spending our dollars where we get the biggest ROI. The problem is, is that that best decision we could make right then and there, it might not rain then for the next 45 days, or it might get 100 degrees, and that fungicide application that cost us 28 bucks that we know gives us a 28 bushel response on this hybrid, we've done everything right, and then weather trumps us. But we, we've got past the idea of having to be right at, in an absolute manner. We're content with being right at that time if that makes any sense. Because, I mean, we're farmers, right? I mean, even when we fail, we're like the eternal Cub fan. There's always next year. We're going to go back out there again, right? And we do that every, every year. So if we can just have peace of making the right decision at that time, to, for us, that's, that's priceless. Most of the time it works. Um, sometimes it doesn't. I mean, this year, um, fungicides with beans, we, we made, some, made some calls not to spray fungicide on some bean fields that we thought we had fairly poor stands on. We had some, um, some, some water issues and some of those things, and we did not spray fungicides on uh, an insecticide on all our bean crop. And it turned out that whether you, it didn't really matter. It was about a 12 to 20 bushel response this year in a lot of places. And so, you know, we could have spent 10 bucks and put another 50 or 60 in our pocket, we should have did that. But at that time, we didn't, and we're okay with that. Hi, I have a question about um, climate change. I mean, how much do you feel you're affected by the changes in the weather, and does it affect what varieties that you're putting on your farm? Is my question clear? It's, yeah, no, it's an interesting question, you know, about climate change. I mean, one of the things, you know, you, there's plenty of climate change denial out there, but in agriculture, we know there are instances of it really happening. In, in Tennessee and Kentucky, for example, you can now double crop canola. Canola is a Canadian spring, spring summer crop, right? So the fact that growers in Kentucky and Tennessee can double crop now where they plant corn and soybeans, like we do here, and then over the winter they can plant and grow a successful canola crop that's an indication that something's changed. You cannot deny that. That's, that's an agricultural result of a climate change. So, you know, what, what have you guys seen up here? It's a great question. Um, in our neck, neck of the woods, it hasn't affected us. Um, I'm, not gonna, I'm not gonna spend money to uh, fix that problem until it shows a direct impact on our farm. Um, but if the time does come, or when it does come, I will make that decision at that time. It hasn't affected me yet. Well, I would agree, disagree with you a little bit, Heath, because climate change can mean a lot of different things. We have had climate change, but it's weather pattern changes, meaning more uh, downpours that are, instead of being a half inch or, or three quarters of an inch, they're four and five inches at once. And the weather patterns have changed to where we'll go through five or six weeks with absolutely no rain and then go through periods where it just constantly rains. To me, that's climate change. Sure, in the big picture, you know, is the world warming or cooling or whatever, you know, um, I don't think we in agriculture are as much concerned about that as we are with the, the uh, uh, variability in weather within a cropping season. Yeah, can I agree? Um, I, you know, you see, you see charts where, you know, this year, you know, uh, seeing some of the coldest days ever recorded uh, might not be the best example, but you can't look at it just one year. Uh, the trend is a slowly but surely there is climate change. I'm not denying it. I might rub a couple feathers here by saying this, but it's actually been pretty beneficial for us. Uh, a rapid accumulation, a higher accumulation of growing degree days, and I think a yield uh, and productivity has been a little bit uh, complement to climate change. It's, it's allowing us to grow a larger crop. I, I think we know a lot more about weather. I'm, I, I, the, the forecasting is better. Um, the, 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 our extremes, to, to Ken's point, um, you know, it's, it's March, right? We should be heating up but we will probably be 50 degrees by the next 10 days. So instead of a gradual thing, it seems like things shut off. This third week of October, 
it kind of slammed the door on us and we haven't had any really harvest, maybe, you know, five or six harvestable days through November and December. I mean, that never, that really never happens. You know, there's not a lot of tillage. I think you're going to see the Mississippi flood this year, you know, not because that, you know, anything happened, but, but there's a huge snowpack and it's going to warm up really, really quick. And so, you know, that affects on, hey, I think I'm a little bit bullish that this crop is going to go up in value, at least short term, because we're not going to get it done in a timely to fashion. So I'm aware of the climate more, but I'm aware of the climate selfishly on how it affects our bottom line and then watching it. And I think it's more accurate right now, whether it be right or wrong. And Ken brought up a really good point, too. Um, I, don't, I don't have as much experience as my father does or, or Ken, but uh, that is the trend that I always hear is, is you know, it, it used to be you get a half inch of rain and now it's, it's, it's all or nothing. It's two inches in 10 minutes, it seems like. Well, I think in agriculture as a whole, we're used to adapting, right? I mean, that's, that's more so than, than any, almost any other industry is that we have to adapt daily. And I don't know that anybody on this panel would argue about climate change, uh, that it's happening. Um, I have a feeling that some of us politically may have a disagreement about why it's happening, but I don't think anybody will deny that it's happening. My dad would disagree with you, but that's neither here nor there. Yeah, I know. <laughs> you guys are Cubs fans, though, too, right? I mean... <laughs> nah, cards, baby. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much to the panel. Let's give them all a round of applause. Thanks for having us here.